Well, this morning we finished our series on the book. And you might have noticed that we did three weeks of the series, took two weeks off, and now we're finishing with week four. That's unusual, but it actually happened because uh, I had an opportunity to be away in Michigan and be planning preaching for 2021 and had great input from pastors and LT members. And, uh, and so just pray as we prepare for a new year coming ahead of us and all that God wants to do. And then also got a week off to relax with my family. So uh, I'm very thankful for those chances to have refreshment and rest. And I'm so glad to be preaching God's Word, uh, both online and on campus. And so we're going to finish up our series called The Book. And what we've learned in the series is that this is the book that Jesus loved. Jesus knew and loved and quoted from the book. We've learned that we, we can come to love God's Word and let it become part of our minds and our hearts and our words and our lives. And God wants that from us. And then we learned that when we know this book and this book gets in our heart and our soul, that God blesses us in a way that we can become a blessing to others. The book is for the world. And the book leads us out into the world with the love of Jesus. Well, for all of that to have meaning in our lives, we have to engage with this book. We have to be truly, fully engaged with our hearts and our minds and our souls. And, and so what does it look like when we're engaged in something? Well, I think, I think, you know, when you think, what does engagement look like in almost every walk of life? You can look at a person, you can say, they're engaged, they are not engaged. So we're going to play a little game called Engaged or Not Engaged. So here's one of our staff people, Lauren, and she's at work in two pictures. One engaged, one not engaged. You tell me. Well, I know you can look at this and you can tell right away where she's at. Uh, here's Brittany, and she's parenting. Engaged and not engaged. The pictures look very, very different, and the end results are very powerful as well. Engage, you can recognize engagement when you see it. Now, have you ever been driving down the road and you see a person swerving or curving and you think, they're not engaged, they're not focused? Well, here's Thomas, and in one picture he looks highly focused and engaged, and the other picture he looks uh, not entirely engaged. It looks like a death trap. Not engaging can cost us. Engaging leads to, really leads to a lot of good things. And so we're going to think about what does it look like to be engaged with the Scriptures. And so we're going to look at those same three people and three different pictures of people engaging with the Scriptures. Here's Lauren engaging with God's Word. You're studying, thinking, reflecting, letting God speak to her. Here's Brittany engaging with the Scriptures. You know, quiet, reflecting, waiting on the Lord. Here's Thomas engaging in a different sort of a way by listening to the Scriptures. Just take a moment and watch this brief video. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. I mean, think about it. You, you, you go, well, does that count? Lay, you know, laying down in a quiet place, listening to the Scriptures. For some people, that will connect with them more and they'll engage more with God that way than they will sitting at a desk trying to learn. What, what we understand is there's lots of ways to engage with God, lots of ways to engage with the Scripture, but the key is to get the truth of God's Word in our minds, in our hearts, and guiding our lives. Whatever way works for you, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later in the message. So I'm going to give you a bunch of ways to engage. Kind of, kind of how, what does it mean to truly engage, and how do we engage in God's Word? Here's the first thing I want to challenge you to do. Engage confidently. Say, I believe this is God's revealed truth. Every time you open this book, every time you read it, engage with confidence. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says this. For all Scripture, all the Bible, is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This book prepares us to be who God wants us to be. This book challenges us. It equips us. It trains us. It moves us. Here's my question. Do you believe that? Do you, do, just ask yourself, do I believe the book is spirit-breathed truth with power to transform me? If you believe that, it makes a world of difference. You, you will read this book uh, with, with a confidence that God is doing something in me. Maybe I feel it and notice it. Maybe I don't. 
But there's a point at which we have to say, this is not just a book, this is God's book. This is the book. It's the book above all books. Breathed by the Spirit of God. And that Spirit who entered me when I put my faith in Jesus, when I read the book inspired by the Spirit, as a person filled with the Spirit, God does something. God moves. And I am confident that every time I open God's Word, something's going to happen. I think of the story of Billy Graham early in his life, before he began his public ministry. He had felt a call. He loved Jesus, but he was struggling. You know, did, did he really believe this book beginning to end? And you know what? Scientifically, you can't prove the authority of the Bible. You, you can prove the historicity of the Bible. You can, you can look at the consistency theologically. You can look at how the Bible was canonized and how through history all these things came together. You can look at older manuscripts and newer manuscripts and see that there's not a corruption of the text. You can do all that. But even with all of that, you, you cannot ultimately say, I can prove this is the very word of God. That's a decision you make to embrace. And Billy Graham was up in a, at, at a campground in, in the Southern California mountains and called, called Forest Home. And he was praying about this. And he knew he was going to start his ministry. And he kind of went out by himself and he laid his Bible down and he looked at it and he said, I have to make a decision. Do I, do I embrace this as the very word of God? And he got on his knees and he made a commitment to God. He said, God, I will take your word as your word from beginning to end. And that launched him into his ministry. He said, I, I, I made that final. I mean, he, he'd done the study. He'd done the thinking. He was intellectual about it. He looked at the background, the history, all of that. But there's a point where he finally said, that last part that comes by faith, I'm putting faith in God and putting faith in his word. I want to challenge you to do that. To be confident with the word of God. To say, I believe this is God's word from beginning to end. Because if you don't believe it's God's word, you're not going to dig into it. If you don't believe it's God's word, you're not going to submit to it. So make that decision. I will be confident in the word of God. Number two, as we engage with God's word, biblical engagement, we engage consistently to say it is a joyful priority and a natural habit. Reading God's book will be part of my lifestyle. A natural habit. It's something I'm going to do again and again and again. It is not a chore it is not something that I'm forced to do, but would you say, God, let me long to read your word. Let me long to hear what you have to say to me and how you want to shape my heart and my life and my attitudes, my motives, my behaviors through your word. In the book of Joshua, chapter one, a very well-known passage. I'll be, Joshua 1, verses seven and eight. Listen to these words. And notice what he says about, about God's law, God's words. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. And then Joshua is exhorted, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Keep God's words always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, all day long. All night long, God's word is in your mind. It's in your heart. It's in your life. So that you may be careful to obey everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Now meditate on this book. Keep it deep in your soul. All day, all night. Let God's word be part of your life. I, I honestly don't believe that that's the way God's book fits into most of our lives. It's not the way that God's book fits into most of the lives of church leaders. Oftentimes it's something we read when we need it for a talk or for a sermon. But I tell you what, if you're raising kids, you need this book to be a consistent part of your life. If you're in a marriage, you need this book to be a consistent part of your life. If you're single, trying to figure out your future, you need this book to be a consistent part of your life. If you have a job, you need this book to guide you through that. If you don't have a job and you're looking for one, you need this book to guide you through it. Every part of life will be better and more directed and have more purpose when you know the word of God. So here's my question for you. Will you ask yourself, will I make daily engagement in God's word a habitual part of my lifestyle? Will you make a decision that, that it's not going to be a thing I do on occasion, but, but just like having meals regularly every day. Just like hopefully brushing my teeth every day. Just like oh, there's things we just do that are part of our lifestyle. They're part of the rhythm of who we are. 
Would this book, reading it, listening to it, thinking about it, applying it to your life, talking about it with other people, sharing it with your children or your grandchildren or with your parents, with your friends, would you make this book so much a part of your life? It's just part of like, it's like breathing. It's just part of who you are. That's what God wants from us. That will strengthen you and prepare you for all that God wants to do in and through you. I remember when I first became a Christian, uh, all the Christians that I knew, and I, again, I didn't grow up around the Christians, and so most of them were high school and college students. But man, they, they had a Bible, and they knew where it was. It was on their nightstand, or it was in their car. It was with them wherever they went. And they read it regularly. It was just something, it was just like, man, and for most of them, they didn't grow up in the church. It was kind of a new thing, but they're like, man, they, they fell in love with God's word. This habitual rhythm of opening up the book, of listening to the book, of letting it shape who we are. It is absolutely life transforming. And so when I first became a Christian, I was encouraged to, uh, to, to read and study the Bible every day. And that really has been part of the rhythm of my life for over 40 years. And it's kind of funny when pe people will say to me oftentimes, um, and they'll say, you know, I really appreciated this or that about this sermon, or I really appreciate, or God really spoke this or that to me. And I'll, when people give me a comment about a sermon, I'll usually say, can I tell you a little secret? I said, I can tell you where I get all my best stuff. Right here. Everything I have to say that has any power comes from this book. And when I preach, it flows out of my heart because, because I seek to live in this book. Do I live it perfectly? No. Do I follow every conviction and challenge that God gives me? I wish I did, but I don't sometimes. But am I striving to? Am I learning to? Am I growing in my love for the word? Yes. And it's been kind of neat since the first of the year with a group of people at Shoreline Church here, I've been on a journey of Bible memory again. So I've been memorizing the book of Revelation. I've memorized chapter one. I'm almost done with chapter two. My hope and prayer by the end of the year is to do chapters three, four, and five and have all that part of my heart and my mind. But I want to show you a few pictures. This, this, this is how I've gotten to the point where, where this portion of Scripture is so deeply in my soul. In the morning when I get up, and I, I'm still in bed, I'm not going to show you a picture of when I'm still in bed, but when I wake up, I'll usually say a quick prayer, and I'll just kind of quiet my heart, and I'll say, and I'll just, in my own mind, I'll say, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. And it just goes on from there. And by then I'm kind of getting up out of bed. When I stand in front of the sink to brush my teeth and, and try to you know, put myself together for the day, I'm going to show you a picture. This is what you see on the mirror in my bathroom. And so the entire part of the passage that I've memorized and the new parts I'm memorizing are all right there. So when I'm Getting ready for the day, it's right there. And then I usually go out to the garage and I get on my elliptical machine. Let me show you a picture of what I see standing on my elliptical machine because it's about uh, four feet of Bible passage and I'm continuing to go through that passage. Then when I get in my car and drive to work, I can plug in my phone and I've recorded the first two chapters of Revelation line by line with a little pause so I can do it out loud with myself at my own pace. And then as I'm going through the day, if I'm going through it different times of the day, if I have a quiet moment, I'll just pick up. I'm working right now on the letter to the church of, of Pergamum. And so I'll be, I'll be going through that. And if I forget something, I can pull it out of my briefcase because I've got it in there too. And I'm highlighting the parts I remember. And, and that's kind of, so throughout the day, but it's been so good for me. And when I get a quiet moment, instead of being like, oh man, what a waste of time, I can just begin to go through God's word and meditate on it. That's growing me as a Christian. That's growing me as a follower of Jesus. What does it look like for you to have a regular rhythm of opening this book? I'll tell you this. I, I'm reading a book right now on habits. And one of the things that this, this person in this book says is they say that if you say, I'm going to start doing this, there's a pretty small chance you're going to do it. But if you say, I'm going to start doing this thing at this time in this place, and you declare it out loud, I am doing it and I pick a time and a place to do it every day. You have a 50% higher chance of actually following through just by picking a time and a place and taking it seriously. I want to challenge you to pick a time and a place. You might say, I'm going to listen to a chapter of the Bible first thing when I wake up every day. That might be your goal. It might be, I'm going to read my Bible every day during my lunch break. You might say, I'm going I'm to listen to the Bible or read the Bible for 15 minutes before I go to bed or as I'm going to bed every night. 
But this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to open up God's word. I'm going to learn from it. And this is the time and this is the place. And then live into that. And so engage in God's word consistently as a lifestyle. Number three, engage expectantly. This is an attitude. I believe God will move, speak, and show up. When you read this book, man, just just begin with a prayer. Spirit of God, I believe that you're going to speak to me. You're going to work in me. You're going to move in my life. And, And so I expect you to do something surprising and wonderful and beautiful. And then you open the word. Be expectant that God is there and God's going to work. In Psalm 119, verses 9 to 11, we read this. How can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. God, as I put your word in my heart, it changes who I am. I expect the truth of your word to to take me on a different path, to live a different way, to have different attitudes. I want to challenge you every time you open God's word to expect God to do something in you and maybe through you. Sometimes you'll read the Bible and it'll just be the sense of, man, I'm filled with joy and peace. Praise the Lord. God did something. Sometimes you're going to read the Bible. It's deep conviction. God uncovers a part of a place in your heart where there's sin and calls you to change. But, But you can expect that God's going to move in some way. Maybe you read the scriptures and all of a sudden you go, man, I need this passage because I'm facing this battle. This is exactly what I needed to stand strong over here. Expect that God is going to fortify you, convict you, bless you, encourage you, uplift you, challenge you, but expect God to do something. Read the Bible expectantly. So here's my question. How have you seen God move in your life, lead you, comfort you, and empower you through his word? And why not engage more in the book? If you stop and think, man, how many times has God encouraged you by his word? How many times has he given you just the wisdom you needed in his word? How many times has he challenged you in the area that you needed a a spiritual boost to get moving forward? If God has done that so many times in the past, why not open this book often and say, God, what are you going to do? How are you going to work? Number four, engage humbly. I am ready to learn and change my mind and my actions. Every time you open this book and you engage with God's word, do it with humility. Say, God, if you challenge me, if you convict me by your spirit through your word, I will humbly yield my life, my attitudes, my words, my thoughts, my behaviors. I will yield everything and surrender it to you. To, to, to what you want to do and how you want to work. And, and that's humility. We don't come to the Bible and say, well, God, I'll read it to find something that I like. I'll read it to find something that kind of fits my lifestyle and my feelings. And, and if it doesn't, I'll ignore it. Or if it doesn't, I'll, I'll just stay away from it. No, we come with humility and say, God, this is your spirit breathed truth. And I will humbly let my life come under your lordship as savior and under the authority of your word. And if you will do that, God will shape your life in beautiful, powerful ways. In Hebrews 4.12, we read these words. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Listen to this. It penetrates even the dividing of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him, whom we, him to whom we must give account. The scripture is talking about the word of God and, and this can mean the word of God in terms of Jesus Christ is the word of God, the spoken word of God, the written word of God, but certainly the written word of God is part of this picture. And the idea is that when God's word comes to your life, it penetrates, it pierces, and it shows where things are wrong and broken and need healing. And so as you, as you open the word of God, you know, come and say, God, cut where you need to cut. Do surgery where you need to do surgery. Change me where you need to change me. And I'll tell you what, it is a dangerous prayer. It is a dangerous prayer to say to God, God, as I read your word, I will humble myself and submit to your word. That is dangerous. Because our, lines are off, our lives are oftentimes more out of line with God's will than we realize. And his word is what can align us. 
but be humble and willing and watch what God does. Here's the question. Will I let God speak, direct, and change me by his word? Will I say, God, you speak, I'll follow. You convict, I'll repent. You teach, I'll become the student. Not, I know it's right, and I'm going to take my thoughts and impose it on your word. And oh, we can all do that. We better watch our hearts. It is so easy to come and read something and go, oh, but I don't like that. Oh, that doesn't fit our culture. That doesn't fit what is popular with my friends. That doesn't even fit what I want to do. So it must be wrong. No, humility says God is right. He made us. He knows how life works. He knows how we're wired. He knows what's best for us even when we don't get it. God, I will humbly follow your word. Number five, engage personally. I will engage in the Bible in ways that fit who he has made me. Will you commit to to study God's word, to read God's word, to listen to God's word in a way that fits how God has made you? We're not all wired the same. Some people want to sit at a desk with a Bible and three or four commentaries and books and highlighters and pencils and, and, and graphs and charts and study, and that works for them. And other people are like, man, that would kill me. But they say, but what I'd love to do is I'd love to just lay out on a grass field and put, put the, the psalms in my ears and just for a half an hour or an hour just listen to God's word and let it become my prayers. And that's, that, I really engage beautifully that way. And somebody says, man, I, I really engage with Scripture when I'm talking with others and we're studying together. What are you learning? What's God saying to you? This is what God's saying to me and, and, and our interaction brings the word alive. And that works for certain other people. There's lots of different ways to engage with the Scriptures. The key is that we engage, that the word of God gets in our minds and our hearts and transforms our lives. That's the key. But, but the exact vehicle by which we get into that varies from person to person. So say, so I will engage personally. A good friend of mine and a good friend of Shoreline Church, Gary Thomas, who, who wrote, who wrote a, a Sacred Marriage and Sacred Parenting and Sacred Pathways, just a great thinker. And Gary comes here about every year and a, year and a half or so and speaks at Shoreline and just blesses us here. And uh, he wrote a book called Sacred Pathways where he looks at nine different kind of ways that people encounter God. And each one is very unique and different. And in the book, he talks about how Jesus encountered the Father all of these ways. Most of us have two or three pathways. So next year, as I go and get into preaching for next year, we're going to do a series looking at these nine. We're going to do about four weeks. We'll look at three pathways a week, and then how do we apply it to our lives? But I encourage you to look and say, I'm going to try different ways to dig into God's Word, to engage with it, and find ways that fit me. And now, right now, on your Shoreline app and on our website, there's 12 different ways to study your Bible. Try all of them in the next month. And you might find two or three, you're like, man, I never studied the Bible that way. I never engaged with Scripture that way. That works for me. I love it. Great. Something may, well, that doesn't really work for me. That's okay. You don't have to engage that way. Don't let somebody tell you you have to sit in a chair for 20 minutes and read your Bible and write in a journal. If that works for you, great. But if that's torture for you, find a way to engage with the Bible that fits how God has made you. And that will draw you into naturally walking with God and growing in His Word. Here's my question. Will you experiment to discover ways to engage with a book naturally? Will you try some new ways? Give it a shot. See what happens. Number six, engage practically. I will intentionally apply God's word. I won't just say, what does it say? I won't just say, what does it mean? I'll ask the question, what am I going to do about it? How is this going to change my life? How I parent how I interact with my friends, how I am as a student, how I am in the workplace, how I am with my neighbors. How does what I'm learning in the word of God shaping who I am as a person? James chapter one, verse 22 says this. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. That's the call to live out what God teaches you in his word. So here's the question. How can I make life application a part of my biblical engagement? How do I make applying the scriptures to my life part of my regular biblical engagement? One of the things I've done oftentimes through my, in my journey as a Christian is I try to write down somewhere in my phone or in a little notepad or in a journal, here's the action I want to take. I want to pray more for this person. And I try to make the action as specific as I can. I don't just write, I'm going to be a nicer person. I'll write down, I'm going to help Sherry every evening with this chore for the next three days. Because here's the difference. If I say I'm going to be a nicer person, I'm probably going to do nothing. 
If I say I'm going to help share you with this for three days and be kind to my wife, now I have something measurable I can do. And then if I really want to ramp it up, I'll tell somebody that I know, hey, listen, will you pray for me? I've made a commitment for the next week to serve this person on our staff team, for the next couple of days to serve this person in our congregation, for the next, you know, and I'll tell them what I'm going to do. Will you pray for me? And in a week, ask me how I did. Now the application is, is getting serious because someone's going to ask me how I did and that moves me into action. And every time I step into action on God's word, I feel better about my faith, better about my life, and my faith grows. And so, and so will, will, you, will you really look and say, how can I make this life application a part, you know, part of my biblical engagement that I won't be done with my time in God's word until I thought about how it changes my life? And number seven and finally, engage corporately. I will learn in community and share what God is teaching me with others. I will not just let it be me, my Bible, and Jesus. And we're going to kind of go off and just always be by myself. But I'm going to share with people what I'm learning. I'm going to ask them what God's teaching them through the Word. I'm going to read the Bible with other people, whether it's my kids or grandkids, whether it's my spouse or my friends. If you have roommates and they're Christians, why not say, hey, maybe once or twice a week we can open the Bible and just read. Let's each read a psalm that we really like and share with each other what it means to us. Man, dynamic things will happen when you share God's word in community. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 3, after the walls are rebuilt and they're starting to try to move back into their, their new life together in community, we read this in Nehemiah 9, 3. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God, for a quarter of the day. For a quarter of the day, they spent another quarter in confession and in worshiping the Lord, their God. Half the day in the Bible, in confession, and in worship. Man, they dug into the scriptures together with God's people. And they actually had people there, somebody didn't understand, they could ask them, what does this mean? And they talk about it together. There's something dynamic about growing in the word in community with God's people. I encourage you to look into that and to investigate that. I know that as a youth pastor years ago, I would often ask students when, that were usually new Christians or long-term Christians, but a lot of new Christians, and I'd get them, get them a Bible, they'd start reading their Bible, and whenever I would see them, I would say, hey, tell me something you're learning from reading the Bible. And they always, they always knew I was going to ask them, and they always had something to share. I think after a while, they knew I was going to ask the question, so they always, when they're reading their Bible, they think, oh, here's a neat thing. I'll, when next time I see Kevin, he's going to ask me, and I'll tell him about what I'm learning. And it's just a way, and, I, and every time they share something, I learned something more. By talking about God's word, not only do they learn and they share what they've learned, I learn from them. And I remember one, one young high school kid, Brian, he had come to me and he actually said, he said, you know, I like the new part of the Bible, the New Testament. I don't like the Old Testament. It, does, it doesn't uh, make any sense to me. So I said to him, well, have you ever read the book of Proverbs? He said, no. I said, well, I'm going to challenge you to read it over the next month. And he took the challenge. And every time I saw him, I'd say, Brian, are you learning anything new from Proverbs? Every time I asked him, he was learning something new. I remember one time, I, and I still remember this, like it was yesterday, I said, Brian, have you learned anything new from the book of Proverbs? He says, oh, man, yeah. He was all excited. I think he was a freshman in high school. He said, yeah, yeah, I read this one Proverbs. He said, I actually, I kind of memorized it. I can tell you it almost word for word. It, here's what it said. It said, if you're looking for good advice, don't go to a fool. I said, well, what's that mean to you, Brian? He said, well, here's the problem. He says, all my friends are fools. <laughs> I thought... Yeah, you're a freshman in high school. There's a, you know, there's a chance that some of them aren't the wisest people in the world. But I said, well, maybe. I said, but I said, who do you know that is wise? And he told me about a couple of people. His, mo his mom had actually passed away. And before his mom passed away, she asked Sherry and I to kind of keep an eye on Brian. She was dying of cancer. And she said, will you just help him along on his journey spiritually? But to watch this young guy, all of a sudden, speaking the words of Scripture, if you're looking for good advice, don't go to a fool. I better find somebody to ask advice. Of. I might ask advice to my friends and they're sending me down the wrong road. There's power in God's word. Would you engage corporately? Here's a question. Who needs to hear about what God is teaching you through the book? And who can you learn from? Let's talk together about God's word. Over these four weeks, we've discovered that this is the book that Jesus loves. This is the book that we should love and have fill us. This is a book not just for us, but a book for the world and a book that leads us out into the world with the good news of Jesus. And if we want to see God move in powerful ways, we need to engage biblical engagement, part of our hearts and our lives. Oh God, that's our prayer. Our prayer is that we would engage with your word, your Holy Spirit-breathed word. 
Would you teach us? Would you rebuke us? Would you train us? Would you prepare us for, for acts of righteousness? Will you, will you instruct us, God? Use your word to impact our lives. Let it become not a chore to read the Bible, but a joy to engage with your beautiful, powerful, holy word. We pray this will become part of our lifestyle now and for all of our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a couple quick words before I send you out for the word of blessing. If you want prayer, maybe there's been an incredible joy and you guys say, I gotta, I gotta have, share with someone and celebrate or maybe a deep pain for you or someone you love. Call the number on the screen and we have pastors and church leaders who are waiting to pray with you. Please give them the honor of praying with you today. If you're new to Shoreline, will you simply text the word welcome to the number you see and when you text that word, we'll reach out to you and we want to give you a personal welcome to Shoreline Church. If you want a new Bible, this is the last week that we'll be announcing it. These are always available if you need them, but, but uh, if, you, if you take that same number and you text the word Bible, we will send you a link and if you'll give us your information where to send this, we will send a Bible to you with our prayers and our encouragement for you to start growing in God's word. If you have any questions about anything going on in the life of Shoreline Church, uh, what, what, what are you planning here? What's coming up for children, for youth? Uh, any questions about services on the weekends? Any questions at all? Uh, just go online and send an email to the email address you see right there, and we will get right back to you with answers to any of your questions. I want to send you off with a word of blessing as we finish the, this four-week series looking at the book. May you love Jesus more and more. May you see how much he loves the book. And may you love the word of God the same way Jesus, our Savior, does. May you feast and feed on God's word. May you meditate on it day and night. May it shape who you are and who you're becoming, how you think and how you act. May God's word draw you closer to the heart of Jesus. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll see you next Sunday.